Good morning. Again, we're here to try to bring some happiness to ourselves and maybe to you. These are tough times. We kind of need a little break in the monotony. So Kendra Manis, the owner and publisher of Slido Magazine, and I have agreed to bring you these morning readings for whatever they're worth. Remember, I'm kind of a writer. I don't know how good, but I'm kind of a writer, but I'm not much of a reader. So if I slur some words or stumble on some sentences, we're not gonna stop. We don't have a editing, uh, any editing equipment for this program. So we're just gonna go right ahead on. Hey, hope you like it. Now, <clears throat> the story that I'm about to read to you has often been said that it would be believed to be fiction if we did not know it was true. This is another one of our stories that reflects back into the history of Slidell, but it reaches beyond that. It reaches to almost a, a universal character, which you'll find out in just a moment. The name of the story is Faster Airplanes, Younger Women, and Bigger Crocodiles. I believe it appears in Bogota Flats. Okay, so let's begin. Faster Airplanes, Younger Women, and Bigger Crocodiles. When I was young, my dad, like all dads, dreamed. He dreamed of ways to get rich, or at least make a better living for his family. Somehow he found out that someone on the Mississippi Gulf Coast had a turnover pie machine for sale. And I suppose he imagines his, himself as being the next Hubig's Pie Company. It was the late 1950s, and he asked me to ride to the coast with him to see and I suppose purchase the machine. I was just a kid, and being from central Mississippi, I'd never seen the Gulf Coast, so I was naturally excited about the trip. As it turned out, the person with the pie maker had sold it, but he told Dad there was one just like it for sale in New Orleans. Dad decided that we would go to New Orleans and look at that one. In those days, the route to New Orleans from the Gulf Coast was U.S. Highway 90. Later, the famous Jane Mansfield would be killed on the strip of highway nearby where we were going. There were no interstates, and Highway 90 passed by a restaurant named the White Kitchen, just east of Slidell. It looked like a promising place for my dad to get coffee and pie, so we stopped. I had noticed that next door to the restaurant was a silhouette sign of a tiger beside the road. Attached to it was a sign that indicated the existence of a small zoo. Of course, this interested me more than the pie and the teaspoon of coffee that Daddy would allow me to hot, hot, have in my cream. Dad gave me 50 cents and I went to the zoo. Even for a kid, there was not much there to interest me, but due to the fact, and, and due to that, I recall very little. I must have not been impressed. I do, however, remember the gruff energetic man that ran it. This was the first and only time that I ever saw Arthur Jones in person. The name of this little zoo was Reptile Jungle, and I do remember a number of snakes and alligators. I do not remember seeing a tiger, as posted on the sign outside. Arthur Jones was born in Arkansas in 1926, but the family soon, soon moved to Seminole, Oklahoma. His parents were both medical doctors, but by all accounts, Arthur walked to the beat of a different drummer. He dropped out of school in the ninth grade and was not known in the community as being its most outstanding young citizen. Arthur Jones was an adventurer, an animal enthusiast, an airplane aficionado, and a mercenary. He must have also liked women, as in his life he was married and divorced six times. The age of his wives ranged from 16 to 20 when he married them. His next to last wife was the beautiful Terry that he married when she was 17 and he was 55. From the humble beginnings of the reptile jungle, Arthur, from his love for the plains, started flying to South America uh, and sometime to Africa to, to Africa to catch wild animals. On many occasions, these ventures were illegal on all three continents. He often flew back home to Slidell and landed his Mitchell B-25 World War II airplane on U.S. Highway 90 between the Pearl River Bridge and the White Kitchen. He would then taxi his plane up the reptile jungle and park it. 
If his cargo was legal, he would notify the authorities and they would block the road while he landed. If his cargo was illegal, he would land late at night, then when there was no traffic. I can't explain how he managed these landings, no runway lights or so forth. But he was once arrested for night having landed with several illegal South American monkeys. Being an adventurer, he started filming his safaris. He produced a television program same weekly called Wild Cargo. It was, it was sponsored in part by the local Bill Garrett Chevrolet Company of Slidell. Good thing for Arthur that there was no OSHA around in those days because several of his episodes depict his crew being in real danger. Once, one of the crew members was attacked by a wild hog and rather than rescue the person, he gave orders just to keep rolling the cameras. With Arthur's love for airplanes, he occasionally served as a mercenary. He said, I've killed 630 men, 63 elephants, and I regret killing the elephants more. Arthur also said that he did not care about the cause for which he was fighting. He just liked the flying and the killing. Later, he said that he had adopted a Teddy Roosevelt attitude, sneak around softly and carry a Thompson submachine gun. I was told by the late attorney Bob Thorne that during the early part of the space race, NASA needed a small amount of a medal that only came from a country that was not in diplomatic relations with the United States. We did have relations with Brazil, and Brazil could acquire this on our behalf. For some reason, the transaction had to sort of be a black market affair. Bob and Arthur headed to Brazil and Arthur's Mitchell B-25 with their luggage stored in the area designed to hold the bombs. Somewhere over Mexico, they decided to have some fun with a small Mexican village consisting of just a few grass huts. Arthur lowered the nose of the B-25 to buzz the village and simulate a bombing run. In his excitement, he pulled the wrong lever and actually released their luggage on the huts below. No one knows if anyone was injured, but some damage to the crew dwelling was visible. When they arrived in Brazil, they had no passport or other credentials, as they had been lost with the luggage. The two men were taken into custody by the local authorities and remained there until they were rescued by the American Embassy. In February of 1963, Arthur loaded his plane with four alligators and crates of poisonous snakes to be sent to an animal show in Cincinnati. Arthur was not known to keep his planes in the best condition, and on this occasion, he was not flying it. As the pilots approached Lunkin Airport, the pilot radioed an emergency. He had no landing gear, one dead engine, and the other engine was sputtering. By radio, emergency personnel asked the pilot what was his passenger count and what was the nature of his cargo. He informed them that his co-pilot had just bailed out and the cargo was poisonous snakes and alligators. Rescue was not prepared for this, and I'm sure were perplexed by this information. There was a crash landing, but no uh, serious injury was reported. No snakes or alligators were released on the citizens of Ohio. It was the late 60s, and while living on Fremont Avenue in Slidell, he developed a bodybuilding machine in his garage. He promoted it and sold several prototypes. He eventually named the machine the Nautilus, and it became the most famous machine of its type in the world. Soon, Arthur was rich. At one time, Forbes magazine listed him as one of the 400 richest men in the world. He went on to invent other exercise equipment for people with back pain. This too was a success. With his money, he began to purchase land around Ocala, Florida, and built a game reserve uh, there of about 750 acres. At one time, he had 98 elements, elephants and 400 reptile species. His menagerie also included seven white rhinos and a 340 pound gorilla named Mickey. Since this story was written, I will interject, there's a documentary on either Netflix or history that shows him putting those elephants on his airplane and flying them from Africa to Florida. He also bought larger and faster planes, and at one time owned three, owned three beast Boeing 707s, one Citation II, a Beach Baron 589, and a Cessna 180. 
He later acquired a Boeing 747 on which he bought 60 plus baby elephants from Africa to Florida. One of his airplanes had the tail number N66AJ. Arthur liked to comment that the 666 was the sign of the devil. Later he eliminated much of the game reserve, but built a subdivision with a runway that could land any aircraft that was in production at the time. A homeowner could land his plane and taxi to his house. The subdivision is today called Jumbo Air, and today John Favolta is one of its residents. Arthur Jones appeared on the Johnny Carson Show 2020 and the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous several times until he passed away in 2007. His motto was, faster airplanes, younger women, and bigger crocodiles. No, my dad never did open the pie business.